Hey, everyone. Thank you for holding through today's hold music and joining us for today's program. Uh, my name is Chris Black. Uh, thank you for holding through the, the call today. Um, just a reminder for today's webcast, and welcome everybody, but just a reminder for today's webcast, just a few quick things before we get started with today's program. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of today's program. We do encourage you, if you have a question at any point, however, to please feel free to enter your question via the Ask a Question box on the left-hand side of your console. Hopefully, if time permits, we'll get to everybody's questions and we'll get out some answers. Today's webcast is also being recorded for future viewing purposes, and be, uh, be sure to check your email uh, that you registered with within about 24 hours after the show where you can view the replay. We encourage you to share that with coworkers and friends who may be interested on today's topic, so we'd appreciate that. Um, as I mentioned, we do have um, a Q&A session at the end, uh, but feel free to, at any time to submit your questions, as I said. Don't be shy. Um, we are hoping that you uh, converse along with us for today's program. Um, there's also a couple resources located down there in the resource tab uh, for today's webcast. Please feel free to take those things away with you uh, with today's program. Well, we'd appreciate that as well. Uh, joining us for today's webcast, we have two really great presenters. Uh, a little bit later on, you're going to hear from Michael Landaway. He is the co-founder of Avanon. Uh, he's going to be here to talk a, bit, a little bit about what his company has to offer. Uh, but first up today, we're going to hear from Nathan O'Brien. Uh, he's a noted uh, author and speaker on webcast just like this one. He is a Microsoft MVP for Office Services and Services. He is a Microsoft Certified Solutions Master in Messaging. Uh, you can reach him on Twitter at mcfmlab. Uh, you can reach him online at mcfmlab.com. And without any further ado, I will hand things over to Nathan to get started with today's program. So please, my friend, get started. Thank you very much, Chris. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, children of all ages. Today we're going to talk a little bit about um, data loss prevention, about data security uh, as it applies to Office 365 and, you know, sort of cloud services and, and that transition, what you really need to know to protect your data and what advice that we can give you on how that all should go. Um, as Chris said, we want you to feel free at any time if you have any questions, put them into the console. We will see those. If uh, we see anything come up uh, that's relevant as we are speaking, I'm, we'll be happy to try and work that into uh, our presentation as we go along. But otherwise, we will uh, save those for the end of the session, and then uh, Michael and I will try and address those, or Michael will get back to people after the session if uh, the more you know, individually personalized questions that he needs to address. So with that, let's uh, get started here about a bit. Um, let's talk about why you need data security. You know, my day job, I'm a consultant. I help organizations move into Office 365, make sure everything work, works. And really one of the major parts of my job these days is, is working out the security aspects of that Office 365 migration, making sure that the customers understand the things they need to pay attention to, um, making sure they understand, you know, the whole regulatory compliance kind of uh, area, how, how the technology fits into that. I'm not a lawyer. I can't give legal advice, um, but I can give technical advice. And sometimes that gets a little confusing for customers. Um, but, but I'll try and explain what I mean about that a little bit more as we go along. So why you need data security um, and what DLP really can do for an organization. In, in my um, sort of experience, I think the first thing that I really want to touch on is what DLP can't do. I think that's what's important here um, as, as organizations first start looking at this. Uh, I often have customers uh, come to me and you know, their intention is to implement DLP, either, you know, an Office 365-based solution or another third-party-based um, solution to prevent bad things from happening to their data, to prevent bad actors. And I really need to stress that, you know, that's not what this technology is for. So if someone wants to, you know, if one of your employees wants to steal credit card numbers, you know, and sell them on, stolen credit card numbers dot dark web or whatever, um, DLP isn't going to prevent that. DLP can't prevent that. You know, everybody has a phone in their pocket with a camera on it. People could take a, take a picture of their computer screen or people could, you know, manually write down 16-digit credit card numbers. There is, you know, there's no technological solution to prevent bad actors that's going to be 100% foolproof. So I think the first thing that's important to think about as you're doing and setting up this DLP is what are your goals for DLP? And 
Um, the primary basic goal, uh, I think, should be that you want to help good people who are trying to do their job properly do their job better. You want to help prevent them from making mistakes. You don't want to, uh, you can't try to keep them from stealing data. If you have people that you think are stealing data, those people should be fired. There's a different solution for that. Technology isn't going to solve that. Let's move on here a little bit. Um, you know, requirements for data security. The sort of things that we have to think about as we're implementing DLP is, you know, how do we teach our systems to classify this data? What, what data are we looking to protect um, versus what data we're not? Obviously, if, you know, if we want to make sure that um, the employees in our company never send any data outside of the company, that solution is easy. Don't use email. Or use email, get an on-premises server, set it up, and don't have that server connected to the Internet then nobody's going to email out your data to the Internet. Obviously, that's a ridiculous solution, though, in, this, in the world that we live and work in. That's not something that you can do. Your people need to be able to communicate with the outside world. So what we're doing with data, with this data classification and with data loss prevention is we're helping our users communicate out with the world kind of gently giving them reminders and guidelines so that they don't make mistakes about accidentally sending credit card numbers outside of the company or social security numbers outside of the company or maybe more complex data sets outside of the company. And that's, you know, we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we get into this. So we really need to classify that data. And then once we have the data classified, we need to figure out what the enforcement mechanism is for that, um, how we're helping these people do the right thing, not how we're forcing these people to do the right thing. And then, you know, policy management, how are, what is our IT administrator's experience uh, in setting up our DLP solutions? What, what does that look like for them? Is that something that they can handle? Um, I find that as, you know, as we move to Office 365 in the cloud, and that becomes more popular. In the early days, I got uh, IT administrators would ask me a lot of questions like, is Office 365 going to make my job obsolete? Um, it depends on your job is the answer to that. If your job is to watch servers and make sure that they don't catch on fire, well, then moving to Office 365 is going to make your job obsolete because you're no longer going to have servers that you can watch. Those are going to be Microsoft servers in Microsoft data center. And Microsoft isn't going to let you come into their data center and stare at their servers. That's not your job anymore. So our job as IT pros, after we make this step to Office 365 and, and cloud computing, has to be more about understanding the service that we're getting from our cloud providers and being able to work with that service as it changes constantly all the time and being able to communicate how these services work to our user population and management and help them use them efficiently and in the best way possible. Uh, a little bit of specifics about Office 365 DLP. Um, I, will, I will start off any talk on this uh, slide with the disclaimer that I am willfully ignorant of any Microsoft licensing concerns. Uh, I intentionally try to keep that out of my brain because it's super confusing and it's not what I do. Um, you know, I focus on making the technology work, not on paying for it. That being said, on this slide, we're kind of showing you that DLP within Office 365 isn't, isn't just one thing. There isn't just one checkbox somewhere that you pay $2 a month and everybody gets DLP. There's different levels and, and different an evolution of DLP in Office 365 that makes different people might have access to different DLP features. Um, since Exchange 2013, DLP has been built into both on-premises, excuse me, and Office 365 Exchange. Uh, that's, it's really an expansion of transport rules, and it's capable of recognizing specific data sets and then acting on it. The way that Exchange was built, the Exchange group made a decision a long time ago that 
any email would go through the transport stack on the Exchange server. Even if you send yourself an email you know, from your mailbox to your mailbox, that email still goes through the transport stack. So then Exchange has an opportunity to examine that email and make decisions about that email uh, based on you know, what's the content of that. So DLP uh, started off as really just an extension of those transport rules. They were prepackaged DLP transport rules uh, for the Exchange stack that worked in Exchange. Um, as DLP expanded in Office 365, now there are also SharePoint and OneDrive for Business aspects to DLP so that, so that you can get more advanced with recognizing different types of data in different spots and you need to understand the licensing really is what we want to what we want to stress here about what features you're getting in in what spots. Uh, this table gives us a little bit a very high level, very very high level breakdown of what you're getting in those different spots. Uh, kind of the basic E3 DLP, you get pattern matching and regular expression. So that means any bit of data that you can express with a regular expression. Um, and and I can't really go into the, you know explaining what that coding language is, but a regular expression is kind of a, a coding language that allows you to match patterns and, and data sets. Anything that you can match with a regular expression, DLP will catch at the most basic level in Office 365 and ask upon. As you get into that higher level, that second level of DLP licensing, Microsoft then brings things like OCR, optical character recognition, so it could read a picture. Like if someone took a picture of you know, 100 credit card numbers and tried to email that out, OCR would potentially read that. I, I, I think uh, even in the best circumstances, it's, it's fair to say that OCR isn't always 100% foolproof in, in every situation. So there should be you know, a little asterisk by that, maybe a little bit. Um, again, it's a guide to help your users do the right thing. It's not a hammer to prevent them from doing bad things. And then uh, database, database fingerprinting is, is one of those more advanced DLP features that you get with the advanced licensing. Moving on here, uh, creating a basic Office 365 DLP policy. So what we, this, these screenshots are from the Office 365 Security and Compliance Center, uh, kind of that evolution level of DLP in Office 365, not where it started off in 2013 that was Exchange only. So what Microsoft did, again, is they developed that DLP in Exchange first, and then you know, SharePoint people thought, hey, that's cool. Let's develop a DLP system for SharePoint data. Um, those are really two separate systems in Office 365. Exchange and SharePoint are still two completely separate products that are built separately um, and, and don't work the same. Uh, Microsoft is just recently this year kind of reorganizing um, and, and trying to bring the products more under a common framework, but that's kind of a subject for a different webcast. Anyway, Exchange and SharePoint are two separate uh, products, so DLP in them is, is separate. And what they've done with the Security and Compliance Center is they've built a front end of a, of a GUI and some scripts that you can run through the GUI and create DLP policies that will then be applied on the back end to these two separate systems so that you have some level of one policy working against all your data. Uh, there are sensitive information types that are defined for you within Office 365, and I think one of the real cool things about Office 365 DLP is the predefined sensitive uh, information types that allows you know, administrators to quickly implement DLP. If your organization is worried about securing one of these predefined information types, then I think, you know, honestly, Office 365 DLP is probably the way to go for your organization in most cases. Um, maybe you're not looking for an add-on service. Where uh, Michael's going to come in and talk a little bit later is maybe those more complex data sets um, where you're trying to protect custom data uh, that, you know, Microsoft hasn't set up a template for. That's where I think a third-party DLP solution uh, is going to come in to hand come in, you know, into play for you more and be something that'll work better for you uh, with, you know, with that, that more advanced uh, administrator uh, interface into your DLP. Um, enforcement capabilities. So, you know, in Office 365, the 
basically there are a number of different enforcement capabilities or what the DLP system does when it recognizes a specific data set. So if we talk about email, uh, I can set up rules. So when I send an email that has two or more credit card numbers, maybe that email can't go outside the company. Or maybe that email does go outside the company, but a copy of that email is sent to the compliance officer. Or maybe a, a pop-up comes in Outlook for that user that says, this email looks like it has credit card numbers in it. Do you really want to send it outside the company? Remember that this will be audited, you know, that sort of thing. So the enforcement capabilities in the built-in Office 365 DLP are kind of like that. And I think Michael's going to talk, you know, a little bit about what the enforcement capabilities that their solution can bring, you know, and add on to that for you. Uh, when we get to his part of the presentation coming up here very quickly. Uh, this slide uh, shows a couple of PowerShell commands. So one of the, I mean, if you're an Office 365 administrator in 2018, um, I think it's important that you know PowerShell and, and be very intimately familiar with PowerShell and how it works. That's where the world is going. And that's where you're going to get really the best controls over um, you know, your Office 365 cloud experience, you're going to get the most, the most detail to be able to do what it is you need to accomplish. So we wanted to show you these. These are some kind of typical PowerShell commands that you should be comfortable with uh, running this sort of thing and understanding what it does if you're going to use Office 365 DLP. That third one there uh, on the list, the dollar sign patent template, that's really that high level sort of um, DLP features that you need the extra level of licensing to be able to use this sort of functionality. And that's the sort of stuff that, that really it takes uh, a bit of training and a bit of thought to be able to, you know, to, to do that part of the uh, Office 365 uh, DLP experience. So uh, this is kind of my last slide here. So how do you know if you need additional DLP over and beyond what's available uh, in your, already in your Office 365 subscription. And, you know, kind of as we talked about, uh, you know, before this, I think really the main benefit that a third-party DLP can bring to you is really that, um, that administrator experience. I, you know, I personally, you know, I'm a consultant and I do this every day. I have had customers say, hey, can Office 365 DLP do X, Y, and Z? to which I've had to answer, yes, it can absolutely do that, and I'd be happy to set that up for you. All I need is two years and $2 million, which is, you know, kind of a lot for a free product. Um, so really it's uh, Office 365 DLP can do a lot of stuff for you. It can provide you with a lot of benefit, but kind of the programming into it and making it do things that aren't those set up predefined data set templates, that's where I think we run into kind of the, the sticky wicket with Office 365 DLP. Uh, so with that, I'm going to bring up uh, Michael. Michael Landau is going to talk a little bit about, uh, about his solution and, and what they have. Michael, please take it away. Well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Nathan. Uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, appreciate uh, the time today. And so um, Nathan did a good job of giving an overview of what currently exist in Office 365 and kind of the direction Office 65 is uh, going when it comes to adding additional capabilities. But I think the, the key message is that Microsoft is a, uh, is a company that provides access to data. And the data leakage prevention is actually a secondary product. In fact, it's a product that um, has you know, borrowed or bought from other companies and pieced together uh, multiple different instances. So what I want to talk about is how to add additional capability above and beyond what Office 365 offers uh, through our product called Avanon. We are a cloud security platform, and uh, while we offer a full stack of security from uh, malware sandboxing and antivirus and um, shadow IT protection, uh, what I want to talk about uh, today is uh, just um, the capability to add additional layers of uh, uh, daily protection. So just to uh, give you a, an overview, 
of what we do. We offer full stack security for any cloud. And the way we do that, and this is key, is that we offer best of breed technology in each of those categories by cloudifying third party tools. And I'll get into more detail about that uh, later. But on top of that, we wrap it all together into a single policy management engine that allows you to control policy, not just in the Office 365, but across all of your, your cloud, all of your uh, SaaS or infrastructure as a service. So let me give you just a little bit overview of the technology before we start um, digging into the Office 365 capabilities. Avanon is a cloud-based platform. Everything we do is in the cloud. We connect the API into Office 365 for OneDrive or Azure or uh, Amazon or Box or any, other, any cloud you might be using. And what this means is that, there, first of all, there's no proxy, there's no rerouting of traffic. Your users just continue using Office 365 like they normally would. And then that API connectivity connects directly to Microsoft servers, so we get 100% visibility. We see every file, we see every user, we see every uh, action, uh, permissions change. It also gives us control, so we can control users, we control files, we can control permissions. So, in architecturally speaking, we're entirely cloud-based. Our the real platform capability is the fact that we can offer that full stack security. We'll talk about uh, just a DLP today, uh, but you'll notice some brand names, or some icons there from uh, some uh, a number of companies you might recognize. So this is key. We have partnered with all the major security vendors in order to create cloudified versions of their security tools. And like I said, we offer you know, the full stack security, but today we'll just talk about uh, data security, DLP. And then kind of the, kind of the related categories, which uh, uh, could be encryption um, or access control, and then uh, beyond that, when it comes to policy management, uh, SIM integration or compliance enforcement. But the, the key thing is, is that by taking, by partnering with these companies, we create zero configuration, cloudified versions of their tools that are available in our app store. You just flip a switch, turn on, and make available in Office 365. So, by connecting to Office 365, we can, for example, turn on uh, Semantic DLP and use it as the classification engine. So these companies, they are specialists in DLP. Now, when it comes to matching credit card numbers or when it comes to um, matching data, they are probably relatively equivalent. Some might have fewer false positives, some uh, might be better at it. But where these companies excel and where um, Microsoft um, really not devoted the effort and that is in the configuration, in the management, in the policy. So what is done in Command Shell in Office 65, these tools excel uh, in making it easy and you know, done in one click. What Avanon provides is the cloud contextual enforcement. So while Office 365, uh, you know, while users are moving around Office 365, there are different parts of Office 365. There's email, there's uh, file sharing. In um, Azure, it could be um, you know, a, uh, a data blob of some sort. While Semantic scans the files for confidential information, Avanon applies policies that make sense for email as in uh, blocking email, alerting on email, um, changing permissions on a file, moving a file, quarantining a file, and, and so on. Okay, so Michael, if I can you know, kind of interrupt you and, and step in here a little bit, I have actually one question from the audience that I kind of want to work in at this point, and that's maybe a couple questions uh, myself to, to maybe help everybody kind of catch up with you. So uh, sure. from the audience, we have a question. Uh, does Office 365 DLP have the ability to view encrypted traffic? Yeah, and this is this is kind of a, a tough question, and um, you know my job is a consultant, and the standard consultant answer to almost every question is it depends. 
and that's the answer to this question as well. Uh, it depends. Uh, in, so any encryption that is inside of Office 365, like Office 365 message encryption or RMS or you know, any encryption that's in Office 365, yes, Office 365 DLP has the ability to read that. That's kind of the benefit, like I talked about, of email going through the transport stack is that, yes, DLP in Office 365 can read that. Um, what Office 365 can't do, though, is read any encryption that's outside of that. Like, if you install a PGP plugin into your Outlook browser and um, when you typed in the words, you hit that plug in, and then it encrypted the words in there before you sent that email. Well, then Office 365 DLP can't read that because you know, we, Office 365 doesn't know about the encryption keys or anything. So hopefully that answers uh, that question from the audience. Um, so you kind of gave us a, a, a little bit about this cloud, cloud contextual enforcement. Can you? Maybe just one more time, give us a, a little bit of an example of what that cloud contextual enforcement means, Michael. Absolutely. In fact, I think um, one thing I would like to clarify, and this is actually the, uh, is when it comes to that, that encryption question, there are uh, different ways to monitor uh, traffic. One is to be a proxy where you're um, in line with the conversation. And with that, if you have encrypted traffic, just you know, HTTPS traffic, uh, you need to break that encryption to read it. The value of the API connection that we have is that we're connected directly into Microsoft servers, and so we have exactly the same visibility that Microsoft does. So even though it's an encrypted connection from the user's phone to Office or you know, to, uh, you know, from the user's desktop to Office, within Microsoft's environment, um, it, if it's readable to Microsoft, it's readable via our API connection. So um, encryption is not an issue there, um, or it would be in the same issue that uh, Office 65 would have. And then when it comes to the cloud contextual enforcement, I think um, this, this is uh, important in that these tools that you have there, uh, the, uh, the checkpoint or uh, Maxi and Semantic and so on, those are essentially built to be kind of an inline device or they understand the context of your desktop or the context of the data center. What we do are try to um, apply the rules that Semantic would apply but in a way that's meaningful for the cloud. And so let's say, uh, let's use a workflow example. If someone sends an email or tries to send an email that has confidential information, we might want to do what some of the Microsoft does and that is say, hey, uh, that looks like it's confidential information. Do you want to remove somebody from their, your email list? Um, or uh, do you want to um, add, uh, you know, remove those credit card numbers? But we can also offer to encrypt that information. So, hey, that uh, the Excel document is going to go out with credit card numbers. Would you like to encrypt that first? And then if, when it is sent out, it's encrypted in such a way that only that reader could read it. Um, cloud context might mean off, uh, OneDrive, being able to move files, move permissions, so that here's a file that's up in the cloud, it's confidential, but it's only being shared by the HR department. That's perfectly fine. But if that very same file is over in another folder that's being shared beyond HR, then we can change permissions, we can move those files, we can actually encrypt it in place. So uh, really it's just taking the classification and um, turning it into an enforcement model that makes sense for that particular cloud environment. Very good, cool. I think that uh, I think that makes it more clear for us. And uh, hopefully, if there's you know anybody in the audience that has any anything additional kind of on that that they want to add, uh, feel free to send us. You know, put in that question in the Q and A um, console, and we will uh, we'll try to answer that. Before you move on, though, Michael, I have you know four little letters, um, one little four letter word that seems like it's coming up every day, all the time recently. Uh, how does all this apply to GDPR? So actually, that's a great question, and I think uh, this is actually where the value of uh, cloud context makes sense in that it's one thing to know that this is a confidential file. It's one thing to know that that uh, email is going out to somebody outside the organization, but what about determining who is currently using the file, where that file is currently stored, and where is that user logging in from? 
So that, that additional context makes it possible to create geography-based policies uh, like GDPR. So I might log in um, to a European instance of Office 365 and feel free to use uh, files, email files, and so on. But if I log in from some someplace outside of, in Canada or South America, our, our system will know that and be able to restrict capabilities based upon geography, and which is essentially what GDPR is. It's a, um, knowing what that data is by classifying it and where it's being used by identifying uh, the user and the recipient. Awesome, very good. So uh, let's, let's, let's move on here from that, and let me ask you, how do you select uh, one of these data classification vendors over another? How does that whole process work for, for your guys and your organization? So actually, that's a, that's a good question, and uh, I, um, I'm going to answer that in a couple different ways. One is going through kind of the checklist of capabilities. Um, each of these uh, companies have uh, the ability to um, do, for example, the pattern matching, a regular expression. In fact, um, our platform by itself has kind of the same capability that Microsoft uh, by itself would. But then with the additional certain partners, we add the optical character recognition or the ability to fingerprint certain types of files, tax forms or healthcare forms and so on, um, or doing uh, an exact file match. Now, you could actually compare each of these uh, based upon just a checklist, just read the feature list. Um, in fact, uh, there, you probably recognize all those names, but you don't recognize uh, GTB there. Um, that company has done really well because it does such a good job with optical character recognition. Um, you know, upside down text, text that, uh, little, you know, roughly written. Uh, it does a good job of converting that into a format that um, can, we, you can actually build policies on. So uh, with that, you can just look at the check, checklist. And then um, where, where the future is going is in the kind of the new AI, you know, artificial intelligence methods um, that, you know, the, the, the more traditional players are just starting to get into, but the smaller players are um, really accelerating on. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, very good. Okay. So that's excellent uh, there on, on that, but so, it kind of leads me to another question that I have, um, you know, about this slide. Um, I have an iPhone. Uh, my iPhone has had Siri on it for, for many, many years. Uh, kind of works sometimes in kind of some situations. If, you know, I stand on one foot and pat my head and rub my belly and talk with just the perfect accent, I can make Siri figure out stuff. So how does, how does AI work for data classification? So this is kind of where the industry is going because uh, the, the finding of the document is, is not the hard part. It's the, uh, the defining of the rules to eliminate uh, the, the false positives because um, it, it be, it, doing it manually just becomes unwieldy. We have customers with you know, terabytes or petabytes worth of data and uh, trying to define what should be considered classified becomes more and more difficult. And so the new AI tools actually do it for you by pointing, uh, they, you know, you point it at um, a, a list of files and, and say, okay, what do these files have in common? You tell me, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning tool, what do these have in common and what can I use uh, to determine uh, what's confidential? So if you see things that are similar to X, then consider it confidential. And these over here, these are not confidential. So uh, determine those. So, uh, for example, we had a, a hospital in which they had a whole bunch of medical records, but it was a, a teaching hospital, so they had a whole bunch of fake medical records that um, they used for examples for classes and so on. And so the ability to separate real medical records from uh, you know, the, the fake medical records, um, you wouldn't be able to do that programmatically, but it could be done using AI. Very cool. Very, very helpful. I think that's really a good use and a, and a you know, very a good way to look at this. So let me, um, let me ask you, you know, going on, going forward here, um, how, what, what vendors are good at different, each different um, 
aspect of this uh, of this data loss prevention kind of stack? How does that all work? How do you make those decisions? Yeah, so um, that kind of leads me to the, kind of the, um, the next slide here, and that is because we have all those tools available on our platform, um, we can just put them on simultaneously. And most of the time when people come to us, they say, you know, we already have semantic, we already have checkpoint, we already have this in the data center, we already have it on the desktop, we just want what we already have in the cloud done. But then others say, hey, uh, we haven't made a decision, and they ask you basically the question you did, how do I compare them side by side? Well, there's no checklist uh, to, to to it. The best way to do it is on your real data. So what a lot of people do is they'll actually turn on more than one. They'll, they'll flip them all on, run it against their real email, against their real files, against the, uh, the real data they have stored in the cloud, and then compare them side by side. And, you know, you would think that a company like ours would be able to tell you, oh, this is the best company, period, um, because we have a lot of customers and a lot of data. But uh, truth of the matter is, if you're in healthcare, product X might be a little bit better to find your type of data, whereas if you're a financial company, product Y might be a little bit better. So there really is no best BLP engine out there we found. It's best for your particular environment, and really the only way to figure that out is, is a side-by-side -side comparison. So, in fact, Whoops, um, just, I, uh, I just okay. muted myself there in, incorrectly there. But, okay, so, yeah, I, I mean, what you're saying there with, with comparing the different DLP engines, I think that's really the same thing that I say a lot over and over again about, you know, is my job safe as I move to Office 365? What the role for us as IT administrators uh, in this new cloud world, I think, is going to end up being and maybe should be is that, it's our job to, you know, help our management and user base kind of sort through all this different information and all these different possibilities um, and, and provide the best answer that works for my organization with the available tools. So I think that's really, that's really a super helpful thing that you're, you're bringing to this whole question there, that, that whole thing. So, okay, I'm moving on though. I see you have uh, encryption as one of the columns on here. How, how does that work? Yeah, so um, I kind of mentioned that before in that, um, you know, we, we can use encryption as one of the uh, enforcement um, policies. And that is, you know, before I send an email out, should I not send it or should I encrypt it before I do? And uh, encryption is one of those things in which it, it's almost impossible to have more than one encryption uh, protocol running within your company because you have, you know, key management and et cetera and so forth. So the last thing we want to do is have a, a, a whole other encryption mechanism for uh, your email and a whole other encryption mechanism for your file in the cloud, a whole other encryption mechanism for what you're using on your desktop. So what this does is allow you to uh, pick and choose. And you might choose, even though, let's say, Semantic has um, a, is a deep, great DLP engine. They also have encryption, but maybe you're not using semantic encryption. This allows you to actually bridge that gap between two different vendors. So you can use one for data classification and another for that encryption so that uh, you can standardize not across your, your enterprise, including the cloud. So I think- Okay, um, very good. I, yeah, in fact, um, I'll- just to um, I'll kind of move on to the, the policy orchestration part of that, and that is, um, you know, bridging policy is kind of the bridging the gap between the detection and then the, the action. And this is where, uh, you know, the, having a platform makes such a big difference in that we bridge that gap between vendor A data classification and vendor B encryption, or it could be vendor A, um, data classification and SAS B or, you know, X, Y, and Z so that we can create, uh, have, create a different rule or create a, a policy that applies to just one cloud or across all clouds simultaneously and then uh, be able to do that in one place. Because while we've been talking about Office 65 and, we, and that might include OneDrive, but 
Um, right now, there is no way to apply a rule to Office 365 and Azure. Microsoft hasn't included Azure into its uh, infrastructure for DLP, much less Google or Amazon or, or Box. So it's not only bridging the gap between different security vendors, but also bridging the gap uh, across cloud. So I okay, so uh, let me... Oh, oh, go ahead. Let me, I want to jump in here real quick with uh, one of the questions that's come in from the, from the audience. Uh, does, does you, Michael, does your organization have an API to hook into our TSA into? Um, I'm not really sure what that means myself, but maybe it makes more sense to you. Sure. So um, part of our, our infrastructure is, because we are a true platform, because um, we, uh, not only do we connect the API to all the cloud, but also we integrate with what you may already have within your environment. We use the standard protocol for your policy engine, for your reporting engine. So in, in most cases, we have that just off the shelf. Um, in other places, uh, like uh, a lot of uh, financial firms have uh, you know, a lot of customized tools. They love the fact that everything we do is API-based, so um, there are hooks uh, to do exactly, you know, exactly what they want in a way that we may not have even predicted before. So, uh, you know, a good example of that yeah. is kind of, uh, of what, we, what I see here is just um, this is kind of our, our policy engine. And here's an example of, you know, creating different policies across different cloud. And, you know, as we, as we drill down, uh, we can see that it's kind of the same point and click that you would get um, in the, the Microsoft wizard, but this is, uh, uh, includes all those uh, pieces and parts in, in one place. So here's, you know, here's a SharePoint DLP um, rule. And, you know, we can pick and choose the, uh, the criteria, so it could be financial information, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, but you'll notice that in the actions, we have a choice of um, moving files, uh, changing permissions in files, um, or um, using a checkpoint capsule um, in order to uh, encrypt a, a file. So the idea is that uh, we're using product X to, uh, to uh, scan for uh, PHI and then using a checkpoint capsule to encrypt it. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I think that's um, so. That's really good. That's really, I think that gives us a good, a good platform to uh, to work with this. And that's really one of the major problems that uh, you know that I see with my customers in, in DLP and how that all works is is having the right um, platform for that. So all this configuration is done within your interface. What what if we need more advanced control though? Yeah, so um, our, our job is to streamline across all these different tools. But what's nice is, is that when we deploy, let's say, this, uh, the semantics in the cloud, we also give you access 99% uh, of the time. You never even need to touch that third-party tool. But uh, we also um, allow you to tune both the detection engine um, or tune uh, the policy um, to customize it for your particular environment. So 99% of the time, it's all point and click, but under the hood, we have some very, very powerful tools to um, even uh, do more advanced things. And uh, in fact, um, I want to kind of show you kind of the, the, the big picture here, and that is, um, you know, in this interface, this is, this is our dashboard. This is uh, bringing everything all together, and that is, you know, malware events, phishing events, uh, anomaly events, shadow IT events, but um, in the center there, you'll see, you know, DLP events, and that's across all clouds. So, you know, Box, Slack, um, Gmail, Azure, um, Salesforce, and so on. And what this means is that um, we, we're more than just a, a silo, and I think uh, one of the key things that um, people come to us about is they have deployed some sort of security with Office 365, and it's fantastic. They love it. However, they have more than Office 365. They have other SaaS, and there really is no way to start rolling out across other SaaS what you've already built in Office 365. Our, our goal here is to 
uh, offer that abstraction layer so that you can see all your cloud and not have to go through each one individually to make changes, uh, to do it from a, a, a central dashboard. And, uh, and then be able to drill down rather than go into a particular SAS, you can drill down into particular issues um, no matter where they are and see it all in one place. In fact, I want to, I'll drill down even more here to show you, you know, here, here is a, a, a sample um, event. Here's a PDF file with a whole bunch of, um, looks like uh, uh, credit card numbers and You'll notice in one place we see all the permissions. Um, who has access to this? Who does not? And maybe we want to change those permissions so that uh, people may or may not be able to share it. We can actually see where the events are arriving from. In fact, uh, we, we have a, a lot of event logs, so um, you can go back in time and say, hey, what, what actually happened to this file? We had a, a, a case of a, a university where um, someone accidentally shared an Excel spreadsheet of all of their donors' credit card numbers. and while that would be a violation and probably involve some fines, we were able to look back in history and say, yes, it was, it was on a share, but no one accessed it. So no harm, no foul, and most importantly, no fine. This, that, having that level of information, um, more than just uh, seeing events, but seeing history, um, really uh, shows the benefit of gathering all that information in one place. Okay, that's um yeah, I really like that. So okay, now just, so, let's, yeah, let's go ahead and and, and and sum up for me. Let's let's do that. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm not yeah, kinda of nothing time there. So um I really kind of the big picture is this is that if uh Microsoft DLP works for you, fantastic. I, um there's there's no no reason to go any farther, but it's not their special thing which is why we offer the industry's best. And we can say industry's best because we pretty much offer them all. And we can uh, find a classification engine that works for you and then apply them not only across Office 65, but across your cloud, not only for DLP, but you know, for all of your, your policy management. So that, that's kind of the, the, the big picture. And um, I know just to, uh, uh, preempt one of the, the questions, I think. I'm going to go ahead and answer uh, the one that, uh, you know, the number one question so far is, um, how much does all this cost? So like I said, um, we, we offer um, a suite of capabilities, and so we, we package them together. Um, so we have our basic security, which offers, you know, anti-phishing and policy enforcement, account takeover. We have our malware suite, which is, you know, antivirus and malware sandboxing. And the, the DLP capability comes in at our you know, five dollar per user per month package. Uh, that's usually because people want malware protection um, as, long, as well as uh, they want uh, DLP. But we also have an a la carte model that allows you to just pick DLP. So if you're if you don't need any more, you just need DLP capabilities. Then um, for you know just a, a or two per, per month per user, uh, we can add that to Office 65 or add it across all your cloud. So um, the packages are to make it easy, um, but the all the gets makes it uh, flexible. So um, that answers kind of the leading question. So uh, we can uh, kind of answer some of the other ones now. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nathan and Michael. I'll give you guys a second to catch your breath here. Um, so for those of you in the audience, if we didn't get your question asked already, uh, please feel free to submit it at this time. Um, if we don't get to your question, please don't take offense. We're just running out of a little bit of time here, so we'll try to squeeze as many questions as we can uh, before we uh, before we close out the webcast today. Uh, so please feel free to submit your questions at this time for Michael and or Nathan if you have a question. Uh, that'd be great. Um, so guys, uh, we'll start the Q&A, uh, but just a, a quick reminder, there's a free 14 day trial um, <clears throat> excuse me you can just uh, visit the URL right there on your screen um, and you can try the 14 day free trial so feel free to go visit that and check everything out and um, and get some experience with it um, so first question here I'll direct it uh, this is for Michael um, what if I want to switch DLP what happens to my policies if so yeah um, that's, a, that's a good question um, what we've done in our case is separate uh, those two pieces. There's the classification and then there's the, the policy. 
And what that means is that you can switch the DLP engine. So you can um, decide to have McAfee and then uh, move to Symantec. Um, in fact, that's actually quite common as people you know, merge companies or move, uh, make other decisions. And the policy stays the same. So um, that, that layer of uh, abstraction make, makes it easy to do that. It also makes it future proof in case something better comes along and I'm 100% sure that it will, you can uh, swap that out without um, you know, doing a kind of root canal switch from one engine to another. Uh, we've got another question here for you from the audience. This person is asking, do I need to have the DLP tool deployed in my data center? So, yeah, that's actually a good question. I think uh, I probably uh, did not um, clarify that just because uh, the it, most people already have DLP within their network, with, and they're just wanting to add DLP to the cloud. That's kind of a typical use case. But no, uh, the answer is um, it can be um, you may have no DLP deployed at all. In fact, you don't need anything in your data center. Everything we do is in the cloud. We uh, take care of deploying it, connecting it. We also take care of all the, the management of it, the scaling of it, the licensing of it. So uh, there, you, it doesn't really matter. You flip a switch, and we take care of everything from the back end. It's just the, the previews per month, and then um, nothing more to do on your on your side. Nothing new, nothing to do in the data center. Uh, we've got a question here. Um... Uh, number one question probably this person wanted to ask was, uh, do you have an estimate? How much does something like this cost? Uh, without getting into specifics, because you don't know somebody's setup, uh, how much does it cost uh, for somebody? Yeah, that's actually, um, yeah, so like I said, most people are getting the bundles, and the bundles are, are cheaper. Um, what we've done is we've taken all these companies' uh, DLP engine and their licensing scheme and converted it into a per user per month pricing, so it could be just, you know, uh, a buck could be two. Um, we also have the case of um, some some of our customers have an enterprise license. So um, you know, Palo Alto might have a, a license for um, their entire the, uh, Palo Alto license for the entire company. In which case, they're paying no additional uh, licensing cost to have it in the cloud. Uh, just cut and paste that license into our cloud instance, and it's done. So for them, um, it just um, I don't want to say free, but it's essentially free in that they're not paying any additional licensing for that capability. So um, our, our business model is that we make money on the platform, um, and you know we, we're not out to make money on these uh, these additional tools. So one, it's the, kind of the cheapest way to deploy these tools because you know it's volume pricing, per user pricing, and uh, we will uh, reach out and try to find the best way to deploy this. So you can purchase it through us per user per month through a third party, you can better, get a better price from someplace else, or you already have a license. So um, I don't have a, a good answer for that, but I will say that um, it's in your best interest, my best interest, uh, to find the cheapest way to deploy that, that technology for you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for the answer for your question. Don't forget, for those of you in the audience, uh, you can check out a free 14-day trial. Um, just use the URL, uh, the URL right there on your screen. Sorry, dealing with some allergies today. Um, let's see here. Uh, question: um, On whose cloud does the DLP records reside? The clients or uh, or on yours? So that's a, that's a great question, especially when it comes to GDPR. Um, and so, we our architecture is such that it was GDPR compliant before GDPR was an, was an issue. And that is, one, to, we do not store uh, the, the raw data. So when we uh, read a file, for example, we'll, um, it'll get scanned for the confidential information, for the credit card numbers, and so on and so forth. But uh, we don't keep a copy of that file. We keep only metadata about the file, and that is the name of the file, uh, who has the permissions of the file, and then when it actually comes to the confidential information that was found, that's uh, dependent upon uh, the customer. So some customers do want us to record in our database the credit card number that was found. Um, that's possible, but most people, uh, we start out. So we'll show just all stars, and maybe just the last four digits or nothing at all. We'll just basically say we found 10 credit card numbers in that file and nothing more. So we're only storing metadata information. That information is stored 
um, in our cloud. And just to uh, give you a uh, peek under the covers, our cloud is actually in Amazon, which means that we can move it anywhere. We can put it in a FedRAMP um, you know, environment. We can put it into a GDPR environment in Europe or even split the data across those. Uh, we actually um, can take that environment and move it into Azure so that um, if people have a preference to have the data stored there. But in the end, we're not storing the raw data. Um, we are just storing the metadata. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michael. I think we've plowed through uh, all the questions that we have here today. So thank you so much for your time. And Nathan as well, thank you for presenting. Both of you guys, that was a lot of fun. Thank you for joining us for today's program. Uh, everybody in the audience, thank you guys for joining us as well. It's, it's been almost an hour. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate that. Everybody who hung on during the pre-conference as well, listening to the music, big thank you to you guys for uh, logging in early. Uh, but today's webcast uh, is brought to you by Redmond Mag. Please feel free to visit the website for future webcasts. And don't forget, you can check out the 14-day free trial uh, right there with the link on your screen. It's also in the resource tab of your doc uh, for easy access. Um, but yeah, everybody, have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk again soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks a lot. <clears throat>